jump in and talk on this panel about the future of digital community. And I've been asked to try to provide some context by providing a little bit of the history of digital community. Um, and this is an interesting thing to do in front of a room full of broadcasters, because the truth is journalists are pretty good at writing the rough draft of history. And as a result, most of us know who famous journalists are. Uh, on the other hand, geeks are really bad at history. Uh, and even the geeks in the room, for the most part, cannot tell you who these men up on the screen are. I will tell you they are the guys at BBN who came up with the interface message processor, which was basically the first internet router. Uh, these guys, not Al Gore, are the actual uh, fathers of the internet. Um, I want to talk about the fact that literally from the moment people have connected computers to one another, we have been using them to talk to one another. In fact, even before that, the internet as we know it came into being in 1969. Uh, but email as we know it came into being in 1965. Uh, even when people were sharing a single machine at MIT, they figured out that they needed to talk to one another. And so what happened as the internet, first ARPANET, came into play, um, the first packets were sent in 1969. By 1971, email was in use on the network. By 1973, it was the main thing people used the network for. Um, so this is a good example of how people put computers towards the purpose of communication, even if the network wasn't designed for it. And what you're looking at up here is the very first internet mailing list in 1975. And it will come as no surprise to any of you that the second message sent out on the first internet mailing list is an apology from the system administrator for the fact that he's doing a lousy job of keeping up with everybody's concerns. Uh, some things really don't change over time. Um, for people of my generation, internet community meant bulletin board systems. It meant these computers that you dialed into to uh, borrow uh, software that others had um, found somewhere that you might use. And, and in fact, the first BBS came up in 1978. Uh, it was called CBBS. It was put together by a guy named Ward Christensen. And the story is that Ward got snowed in in Chicago and over the course of two weeks wrote a program on this miserable machine here, which let people come in and share old IBM CPM software. So that's 1978. By 79, we had Usenet. Uh, and this is the precursor to all the threaded message boards anyone has ever used on the web. Usenet had thousands and thousands and thousands of topics, most of which were completely irrelevant even to the people who participated in them. Also in 1979, we had a wonderful phenomenon, MUDs, multi-user dungeons, the ability to walk around in little text spaces and kill dragons with other people. And most of us thought this was completely irrelevant until we started having basically the same thing with really pretty pictures. And people said it was really, really important. And they call them massively multiplayer online games. This is World of Warcraft that we're looking at. But again, 1979, this is the time in, in internet history where we invented the emoticon, right? You know, we actually see it for the first time. I'm sorry, I don't have it in here. But it's just a dash and uh, a pren was meant to be tongue in cheek. We don't actually get eyes attached to it for another two years. Look, <laughs> in 1982, we have a critical moment in the development of online chat. We have Minitel. This is what happens when you let a national government engineer the internet. It's little and pink and very hard to type on. But what happened with Minitel was Minitel introduced a chess program. And the chess program had a chat feature. And people quickly discovered that you could flirt with people you'd never met before in the chat feature. And this is the birth of I am as we know it today. In fact, there's a lot of people from a certain generation in France who all you have to do is say 3165. Uh, and they refer to anything as 3165 as being about sexual content, because that was the number you dialed on Minitel to get the chat lines. We haven't come so far. In 1990, we get the World Wide Web, and, and some people start realizing that this is something that isn't just used by people who look like me. And this is the first homepage we get at CERN. It actually looks very much like this today. In 1995, we suddenly have companies like GeoCities and Tripod allowing anybody to build pages that should look like this and instead end up looking like this. 
And despite the fact that in 1995 most of the web does in fact look like this, we have in 1997 people dedicating themselves to trying to find the best within this mess and putting it together in something that they call web logs where they're annotating what they think are the best bits of it. And by pointing all of these blogs at one another, we get this sort of emergent community of people pointing to one another. If everyone stands here and points to somebody else, we basically get the same sort of community that we're used to having in the blogosphere. You can all try it right now. You're now a blogger. Ward Cunningham, 1995, figures it's not enough just to have one person edit a web page. Why not have everybody edit a web page? Which sounds like a phenomenally stupid idea until you try to run an encyclopedia on top of it, which works remarkably well. And it actually turns out that if you put dozens and dozens and hundreds of monkeys together in a room, they actually write encyclopedias, and they're pretty good. So why now, at the end of this internet history, where I'm trying to make the point that a lot of the really interesting community stuff was invented in 1982 or 1979, are we all suddenly paying attention to it? The simple answer is that there's a whole lot of graphs that look like this one. This is the graph of hosts connected to the internet. But you could make a graph of total internet connectivity. You could make a graph of total number of web pages. You could make a graph of total number of web users. They all look more or less like this one. And what this leads us to is a world in which 68.6% .6 of Americans are currently connected to the internet. Some of us seem to be connected 68.6% .6 of the total hours of our lives. And this leads to things like hundreds of millions of people creating pages on things like MySpace and otherwise semi-sensible news organizations paying $600 million for it, which leads us to our panel today. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. If we can switch over, let's switch over to two. We have here today four people who are pioneering the idea of community and community media on the web in one fashion or another in very different ways. We're going to give them all a chance to talk, and then we're going to invite our presence from Oxford to join us. But we're going to lead off with Brendan Greeley, who is the blogger-in-chief with Radio Open Source. Radio Open Source is a radio show that has been heavily influenced by the sort of technologies that I just gave a breakneck talk about. And Brennan's going to tell us what it's all about. Uh, I just realized that I'm about to explain to you <clears throat> how it is that I'm learning right now all the things that Ethan has known for decades. So um, uh, we, the, the easiest way to explain radio open source is that it's a blog with a radio show. And it seems like a semantic distinction because, of course, we are a radio show. We're, we're on 35 stations, public radio stations. We're distributed by PRI. Um, but the way we wanted to go about it is to have the blog come first, uh, focus on the blog, bring people in through the blog, find information through it, and use that to produce uh, a nightly hour of radio. So um, I'm going to leave you right now with a cone that you can consider while I give you a little background. Uh, Chris Lydon and Mary McGrath uh, started a show called The Connection in the 90s, uh, and uh, by the late 90s, The Connection had uh, message boards uh, with about 7,000 people on them. So they were starting to recognize that there was something significant going on in the message boards and that people were showing up on the message boards not necessarily to talk about the connection but to just talk about each other and anything they felt like. So um, there's another story that goes in between there that is the subject of another presentation but they're no longer doing the connection and three years later uh, they started a show called uh, Open Source. So. The question that we had at the beginning of open source is now that in addition to the popularity of, or the widespread popularity of message boards that we saw in the late 90s, uh, there, are, uh, there are blogs, there is Craigslist, there are all sorts of other ways that people are using popularly to communicate with each other. So I have to admit something right now. Uh, last night, Thomas and I were at dinner and I asked him what he was doing uh, after dinner and he said, I'm going home uh, to find some Flickr pictures to put them into my presentation. And I thought, crap. Of course, Flickr pictures. So um, <laughs> I just want to just make sure that everybody knows that all the pictures that are in this presentation are just a pathetic attempt to close the Flickr gap. <laughs> so um, 
I, uh, I, I did a search for uh, chaos on Flickr, and uh, this is one of the first ones that showed up under Creative Commons license. Uh, so I looked at it for a second, um, and interestingly enough, it's kind of what the internet is like. You have uh, uh, up in the left-hand corner there a, a sort of rusted steel cutout of a bunny rabbit. Um, there's Dick Cheney, there's Ahmad Ahmadinejad, and then down in the front you have uh, a group of young people. One of them's a little older, he's wearing a cool leather jacket, and he's explaining things to everybody else. That's kind of what the internet sounds like. <laughs> Um, that's a happy little detail there. And I also realized looking at this that this is kind of what my brain feels like after reading through blogs in the morning. Uh, and there's a danger uh, to getting your information this way because I think uh, at a certain point as we're looking through all this information, we forget where the information comes from. Um, and that is public broadcasting's role, or at least that's the role we've taken on ourselves to take this unbelievable volume of information, some of it fascinating, um, and, uh, and figure out how to add to it the values of public radio, which are sourcing and finding a narrative uh, and figuring out how to present it to people in a way that they retain it and also know where it came from. So um, there are uh, a number of ways uh, that we could have structured this show. Um, we could have made it uh, a series of message boards. We could have set up a wiki and let anyone uh, sort of produce what they wanted. Uh, we decided on a blog for a couple of reasons. This is, um, you can draw what conclusions you want from this picture. I, I did a Flickr search for blog and that was one of the first ones that came up from a person named Spoil. So. Um, uh, we like to think of blogs as the new talk radio. This is apocryphal story. You hear it from a lot of different early bloggers, and they all say the same sentence. I started blogging because uh, I was tired of sitting on my couch yelling at insert broadcaster here. So <laughs> Rush Limbaugh or Dan Rather. or So uh, it, it is essentially the stru it's structurally the same thing as a blog. You have a person who's talking. You have people who are coming in and talking back. You have lots of people who are asking questions. You have those questions being answered. Um, the other thing that we liked about the structure of a blog is that um, you as the blogger, as the person who is running the site, you can make decisions. You can say, this is what we're talking about today. This is what I'm interested in today. And it allows you to guide the conversation. Um, and, and in the same way, a blog has motion. Um, it's, uh, it, it is one post after another uh, coming in rapid succession. Uh, people, and, and in that way, it's very similar to broadcast. There are topics coming up. People address them. They move back in the past. You can still find them on the web, but we have moved on to the next subject. And there are drawbacks to that approach as well. So uh, what we decided um, is uh, that we were going to structure the site exactly like a blog. You have here the standard blog layout. You've got uh, three columns uh, and uh, posts moving forward in the future. And the idea was, without having to tell anyone explicitly, we wanted people to assume that they had the right to engage in blog-like behaviors with our website. So uh, you can link back to us. You have the right to comment on our pages. That was also really crucial, is that we didn't want to section people off into a, uh, into a discussion ghetto where we said, okay, well, you know, you've got your forums over there and you can talk about that, but we're going to be producing our radio show over here. So you have the right to leave your mark, your opinion, in the exact same place that we're producing our radio show right there on the comment threads. Um, we, we, we post the shows in advance uh, so that um, as we're booking the guests, people can tell us what guests they'd like to hear from, what questions they'd like to ask, what websites we should be consulting for more information. So um, this, of course, showed up when I did a Flickr search for blog. Um, uh, the way we've gone about producing this show is to act like a blog. And for the bloggers in here, all of these behaviors are self-evident. Of course this is what you do when you're a blogger. And the amazing thing, I gave a talk on Friday to a group of public radio producers, and all of this was, was brand new to them. So the simple idea that you have to have a permalink that everybody can always link back to, it's news to broadcasters. It's still, still something we're coming to terms with. Um, the use of technorati uh, is, uh, is something that they weren't familiar with at all, that I had to follow up with an email to sort of explain how it is that it worked. Um, but the, the way that blogs build community, the way that they draw people in, um, and this is point four, you, you have to act like you mean it. You can't just tell people to link back to you. And this is a question that I had to answer on Friday as well. How do you get people to link back to you? You can't send them an email and say, please link back. Uh, you have to engage them in a conversation. You write them an email, you say, you know, I read your blog, I've kind of, I'm interested in what it is that, uh, that you're writing about, I saw this point, and what do you say, um, what, you know, what does your community say to this, or what do you say in response to this? And this is a lesson that we had to learn. I actually had interns for a while cranking through blog searches and writing 20 emails a day to different bloggers, and we realized it was a better use of their time, and it was far less offensive if we found three bloggers 
really read their blogs and sent a detailed personal email. We, you, the, the response rate is far greater and it's a better use of your time and it's also, it's a nicer way to interact with people. So Brendan, this is an amazing set of lessons learned for anyone who's sort of thinking about using blogs in the context of a radio show, a broadcast medium as a whole. Um, we're going to ask Tom if he can talk about the sort of larger question, which is as you start sort of scaling this up and trying to figure out how do you provide community to the entire world, not just of one extremely innovative, extremely successful radio show, but to the world of NPR as a whole. So let's see if we can switch over to your monitor here. Is that your subtle signal that I've run out of time? <laughs> The, the, the orange was a threat, actually. I, I, I was, I, at the five-minute mark, I started, you know, sort of, you know. Anyway. Thank you. Well, about two years ago, uh, I was about to publish the 430th entry in my personal uh, blog, and I realized I was feeling a lot like Zaphod Beeblebrox, uh, which uh, is a main character for, in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, for those who don't know Douglas Adams. And during the book... Beeblebrox is about to be tortured in the worst possible way, in the most painful possible way, uh, which is that he's about to be placed in the total perspective vortex. And the total perspective vortex does one thing, which turns the human brain to mush, which is show you your relative position or your relative importance in the universe. Well, as a blogger, as I was about to hit that publish button, I suddenly realized I had no idea if anybody was reading or if my thoughts were going to change the world. Or if, frankly, I was beginning that ripple effect that might mean something. And that was me sitting at my desk years ago. Well, with now millions of people publishing online and hundreds of organizations creating content online, increasingly, organizations, including public media organizations, are asking themselves that same question. Am I relevant uh, or will I turn to mush if I were to realize my place in the universe? Um, Increasingly, the question is, uh, should I play in this space? Should I invest in this space? And should I take the millions of dollars and dozens of people in my organization and begin to do something different from what my core operation has been? Well, to answer that question, whether or not you're doing it individually uh, or as a public media organization or as a corporation, you've got to first ask who you are. What's your mission? And many public media organizations have a mission like the one you see uh, behind me, to enrich the mind and nourish the spirit, uh, thereby enhancing the lives and the perspectives of audiences and assisting them in strengthening their communities. And you also need to think about who people think you are. Uh, what is your value proposition? And in public media's case, at least from one person, one listener's perspective, uh, it can be learning uh, or reaching beyond individual experience, discovering new things, uh, understanding the human condition in a way that I can't uh, in my own small world. And I go to public media for a trusted and balanced perspective. And how do you create value? How do you deliver on this value proposition? Well, in the traditional media model, it's content creation centrally done, editorial selection centrally done, and the distribution uh, of this content to an audience and hopefully the nurturing of that audience. But how do you do this today when there's a massive shift in media? When in the world of media, people are increasingly focused not on centrally created, centrally controlled, centrally edited content, but on user created, user controlled, and user edited content. And one of Ethan's graphs will uh, be helpful here. If you compare the site rank of CNN in red, the New York Times in green, AOL.com in that mustard brown color, and MySpace going from the bottom left to the top right of the chart, you'll see that audience shift, that audience attention, that audience of focus is increasingly on the content people are creating one for another rather than what's centrally created. Another one of those graphs would show you what was already happening pre-MySpace in the blogosphere with 34 million blogs, uh, thanks to Technorati for the data, uh, being published today, doubling every five months, and they're generating about two million pieces of content each day. So there's a lot of stuff out there, and it's easy to fall victim to the Beeblebrox problem unless you organize the content in a meaningful way. And for bloggers, the challenge, or for readers of the blogosphere, the challenge is that good content's hard to find, not because it's not there, but because it's lost in a sea of mediocrity. Content is hard to compare. You can't comparison shop blog to blog because they hit many different topics and it's hard to find good stuff once, much less 10 times. It's hard to figure out if you can trust somebody who's writing because you've never met them and it's hard to evaluate whether or not 
their uh, reliable people. And if 400,000 people are reading the same political blog, it's the oddest darn thing. It's still a one-way medium. Those 400,000 people cannot connect, organize, and experience one another. From the writer's perspective, the challenge is the flip side of that coin. You can't build an audience. Uh, it's hard to maintain an audience unless you're willing to do it full time and write three times a day. It's hard to build credibility. While the early investors could do it by having lots of people point at them, if you're joining the blogosphere today, it's almost impossible uh, to reach the level the early investors did. And then if you want to do it full time, if you really want to make this a key con contribution for yourself, it's how do you monetize the effort so that it becomes sustainable? And how do you, of course, connect with your audience? Well, that, these are exactly the challenges Gather's focused on solving. On Gather, our users create all of our content. They organize our content. They edit our content through ratings and evaluation. Our users recruit their own readers and connect with them, extending our audience. And they explore shared passions through content tagging. So you can find at gather.com slash food, all of our food content, gather.com slash politics, all of our political content, or by launching groups on Gather where they can focus in on those topics. And users are doing just that. Right now on Gather, a new article is published every four minutes, a new comment every 21 seconds. You can see the traffic trends, uh, the publishing trends up and to the right. And if you want to check out the group of most avid Gather uh, participants, you can check out the Gatherholics group. Uh, Gatherholics are the folks that see their lives being changed because they're spending way too much time on Gather and their families are noticing the change, their careers are noticing, their employers are noticing the change, and they're trying to figure out how to get off the drug. So the value proposition question comes back then. How do you create value in this space if you want to invest? Well, I think it's clear to most media players they need to invest. Their audience is going here anyway. But from a public radio perspective, the answer is you can create true value for your audience by transforming a listening audience into a broad source network. You can create value by instead of centrally editing all your content, relying on the community to bring some of the best stuff forward, and then applying your special skills in content selection and in fact checking. And you can, in your own space, guide the community to interesting topics and places they might not otherwise explore by picking out key things for your community to do each day. Great, and we've got some terrific questions already coming in on the question tool. Um, actually, for both of our speakers so far, there's a couple of them uh, especially uh, pointed towards gather.com. So one of the reasons I'm being um, uh, such a jerk with the orange is in the, the <laughs> high hopes that we're actually going to get to the point where we can get some questions from this amazing audience here. So uh, I promise we're getting there. Um, but I would uh, hope that we could now switch over out of the public radio medium uh, over to a different space, uh, the space of video production with listenup.org. Uh, Ria Mokund is the director over there. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the idea that uh, video is a team sport and uh, how teams are coming together to both build and distribute video. So thanks for being with us. Thank you. Uh, thanks for, for inviting me. I uh, got on the 6 a.m. train from New York this morning. My computer did not. And so instead of looking at the screen behind me, I hope you all will pay me some attention. <laughs> I, I want to take a step back. Listen Up is different in several ways. So far we've talked about uh, public radio. Listen Up is different in that we're uh, going to be talking mostly here about video production and also that Listen Up is really about uh, an audience dedicated or a space dedicated to, to young people in America and, and globally. Listen Up is essentially a network of youth media organizations around the world. There are about 127 organizations around the world, 117 of which are in North America. So Listen Up acts as a network, so we share support, resources, uh, uh, workshops, etc. But Listen Up is sort of a many-headed hydra in that we also provide funding to many of the organizations in our network to create productions for television, film festivals, etc. cetera. Uh, Listen Up is, is also unique in that, um, as we've heard, uh, a lot of the work that happens on our website is then distributed through public media, and we can talk a bit about that. Um, Listen Up started really 
to provide a real world space for youth media. When we came on the scene about uh, eight or nine years ago in 1998, there were very few organizations producing youth media who were even aware of each other. So that I would pick up the phone and call someone in Alaska and they'd say, you're never gonna find anybody else doing this. We're the only people in America doing this. And then I'd call somebody in Florida and they'd say, you're never gonna find anybody else doing this. I'm the only person in America doing it. And so at the time, our goal was to produce media uh, in the form of a public service message campaign to send out to broadcasters. And my colleague, Austin, who's not here, looked at me and said, you know, this is very strange. We can't get anything done because these organizations have no sense of each other. And in order for us to get the best possible quality work, we're going to have to get these people talking. And because at that time, the, the nonprofit for which I work was connected to PBS, we had all this unlimited space. And I hope nobody from PBS is here. Um, we had all of this server space, and we thought, let's go online. And so listenup.org was born. Um, we started soliciting public service messages from youth media organizations, and at the time there were about 20 of them, this is in around 1999, that produced media with young people. And we said, we will create for you your own website, which at the time, very, very, very few of the organizations who were working with young people in media had more than one person in the organization, and that person wasn't an expert in streaming media. So we said this is a service that we could provide to the organizations in our network with all of that server space from PBS. And we did. Three years went by, and by that time, Listen Up had over 3,000 pieces of youth media produced by and for young people largely on the server. Uh, PBS caught up with us and said, you guys better find your own space. And so we found this incredible partnership with the Internet Archive, and I'm sure you all know them and love them as, as I do. And the Internet Archive gave us the same amount of support that, that the PBS server had unknowingly given us. So, um, the, so that Listen Up has emerged as the largest collection of young people's video online anywhere. It is different from a lot of online video in that, in a sense, it's curated. Uh, and it's not curated by us, it's curated by the young people who use the website. On the current site, you'll notice that young people can go on and rate and communicate with the producer of the media. Now, in, in this way, Listen Up is sort of like a dating site. Because we're working with young people, most of whom are under 18, you can't ever email them directly so that the email comes to us or comes through us and then is sent to that young person's personal email. We, we take that protection very, very seriously. Um, young, people's, uh, young people's full name and address, et cetera, never appear anywhere on our site. So we've, we've tried to make it very, very difficult for anyone to be able to say, ah, Sarah in Nebraska lives on Main Street and she's produced this piece about sexuality and I'm gonna go find her. Um, so we have, again, on the space, anybody in the world can communicate uh, with the young people in our closed network, but only through listenup.org, where they can comment on the work that's being produced, et cetera, et cetera. Young people have their own private space um, on the website where they can exchange information, they can um, come together to talk about uh, specific problems that they're having in, in the production of media. All of the work that's on Listen Up is very, very much presented from young people's point of view. The only thing that we censor for is hate messages. Um, we don't, you know, again, all the curation is done uh, by young people themselves. So that what we've found is this very, very active, but in a sense exclusive network of young people all over the world who are communicating and who are using these videos to begin dialogues about whatever uh, topic or, or issue is important to them. Um, in 2001, uh, right after September 11th, Listen Up uh, launched our first online film festival. Um, and it was just called a call for tolerance and understanding. And we began to get an influx of um, media and um, an influx of responses from youth as far away as Pakistan, Malawi, Zimbabwe, uh, just everywhere we could think of. We, we were actually inundated with a response from young people all over the world, all of whom either wanted to contribute um, a piece of media 
or wanted to contribute some thought or comment. And this emerged as a really safe space for them to do that. This eventually became our first piece of media that was initially packaged for online use that made it into public, into the public broadcast sphere. What happened was because of the because of the large numbers of young people that started using a call for tolerance and understanding and teachers found it and started using it in classrooms, it really bubbled up from a real grassroots perspective. And we started getting call from public, meet, from public access centers, from local PBS stations, and this work eventually ended up on television. I will admit that in thinking about Listen Up eight years ago and in thinking even about the website, it's emerged very much like old New York. You know, if you are in midtown Manhattan, everything's all laid out and it's very pretty and you can get from 5th to 6th to 7th Avenue and it makes a lot of sense. Um, Listen Up didn't really start that way. Um, we started very much in the spirit of, oh, this is a need, let's tag it on here. This is a need, let's tag it on here. So that what we've, what we've emerged with, and in talking with Susie Lindsay, who is the person who invited me on this panel, she said, you all are very, very interesting. You're a little bit like YouTube in that you've got the media, but you're a little bit like Friendster in that you've got the community, and you're a little bit like somebody else because it's very exclusive. Um, and the one thing that you're doing that we don't know that anyone else is doing is having this work really that was created with the, with the, with the internet in mind live on, uh, live on in public broadcasting. Are my five minutes up? No orange so, for me? So, no, the, the, the orange came up a moment ago, oh. so I didn't, I didn't toss it over there because the 9-11 the, the story was so great that I, <laughs> I thought it would be a little inappropriate to sort of, and, and then we started getting I into New York purpose. analogies and I was wondering how Cambridge sort of fits in as a, <laughs> an, an agglomerated city rather than a, a planned one. But um, uh, Listen Up is an amazing example of how digital communities came together to solve a very real problem of lots of independent video producers uh, around the world doing great work, not sharing it with one another. Uh, one of the things that we're finding in general with the internet is the incredible power of networks. One of the companies that's had the greatest success with the power of networks has been eBay, which has figured out that by having lots of people around the world tell you who's committing fraud and who's an honest guy to deal with, you can actually run an enormous global marketplace. And one of the many good things that has come out of eBay is uh, the Omidyar network. And so we're going to hand this over to uh, Thomas Kreese to talk about how the Omidyar network is thinking about community and social change and philanthropy in the future. So what we brought over from uh, our experiences with eBay was this notion of a feedback system. Uh, if you're going to have all of this content that's out there and all these people coming to contribute, how do you actually manage this community that's come around? And so we decided that, uh, backing up a moment to talk about the Omidyar network, we, as I get my technology straight, uh, it was established in 2004 by Pam and Pierre Omidyar. Uh, it is a mission-based investment group. We were a foundation up until early 2004, and then the network emerged so that we'd be able to invest in both for-profit and non-profit organizations. We have a $400 million fund to invest over the next five years. And what we're really looking for is individual self-empowerment on a global scale, economically, socially, and politically. Now, omidyar.net is an online community that's hosted by Omidyar Network. And the three criteria of our mission uh, was what we used to sort of build into the framework of this community, uh, the notion of access to information, the notion of providing collaborative space, and the sense of ownership. The users actually decide what goes on in the community. So it's a group-based collaborative tool that we use internally to help us to make better investment decisions. And we found it to be so powerful that in July 2nd of 2004, we said, let's put it out there to see what people can actually do with the same set of collaborative tools. Well, there are ground rules to using Omidyar.net, three very simple ground rules. Number one, everyone who's there believes in making the world a better place. Number two, people believe in treating each other with respect. And number three, people believe that everyone has something to contribute. They might not have something to contribute at the appropriate time in the appropriate place, but they've got something that may stir the pot and help uh, to spice things up a little bit. They may help people to realize that perhaps giving negative feedback might be worth doing every once in a while, um, but they also might contribute something that's uh, very novel that we would never have come across before. Now, anybody who's a member of Omidyar.net can see any comment on Omidyar.net. There's no such thing as a private group. 
So if you're in, you can see everything that goes on there. This is this notion of transparency. And if you can read a discussion, you can comment on that discussion. There's no watching on the sidelines. I wish I could chime in, but I don't have the appropriate rights. Everybody can actually chime in wherever they see the discussion started. And the content of Amidiar.net is automatically categorized based on these inputs from folks. Uh, they can see what's new. They can see what's highly rated. They can see what's important to others. They can see uh, what has been read, because what has been read the most is not necessarily what has been rated the highest. Our feedback system has two parts to it. Number one is there's a score. There's a score on every single piece of content and person in Amidiar.net. We have separated out the notion of rating authors and rating the content that they generate because while I really like spending time with Brendan and I have a high reputation or he has a high reputation in my eyes, if he says something boneheaded, I want to be able to mark that boneheaded comment separately from my overall reputation of Brendan. If he continues to say boneheaded things, then the reputation takes a hit. But I want to be able to have that ability to, to rate these two things separately. There's the notion of bank. Uh, bank, every member has one when they start out. They have 10 points in their bank. And based on their activity in the community, they earn more uh, bank to give away. So this bank is distributed in terms of positive or negative feedback that's given to other people or given to other content. And we do charge points for certain aspects of the community. It's a group-based community. So if I want to start a group, which for us means uh, creating another namespace and file space and all these other things, we don't want people to, to have the BMW owners group versus the owners group for BMWs versus the BMW USA owner group. We're just going to have that in one space, so we make it a little bit expensive in terms of time and activity for people to create their own groups. How it works is that there's a feedback system, uh, feedback score is displayed next to every item, and you can actually audit that score. You can click on it to see where it came from. Because two scores that are equal to 100 don't mean the same thing on Amidiar.net. If someone gave 100 points, one person gave 100 points to a score, to a particular content item, we think that says something different from another piece of content that got two points from 50 different people. Those say two different things. We're not saying which is better. We're just giving them the opportunity to make that uh, determination themselves. The community actually bubbles up these items of interest, and there are consequences for negative feedback scores. If you get a certain amount of negative feedback, the comments close. If a person gets too much negative feedback, then all of their comments close, no matter where they are in the community. If they get even more negative feedback than that, they actually lose the ability to participate in the community. So this is community members. Everybody has their points to give away. And now let's look at it in action. Here's a group of Amidiar.net members that got together last July. And they actually help us to decide what goes on the front page news. Um, here in the red square is what has been bubbled up from the actual uh, members themselves. On each given thing, you can see the title. You can see the feedback score. Who was it that posted that item? And who was the last person to comment on it? If we look at the active users list, so these are the people who probably have the biggest banks because they've been the most active. We actually show you at the top, you see number one and the most active recently. Linda is there, and there's her feedback score. You can look down the list, and you can sort of make some determinations as to who's there, who's not. We also show the newest members coming in so that everybody gets a chance to be seen. Popping over to top rated users, these are the people who on the left column might be considered to be the most popular. But on the right column, these are the folks who probably have the highest signal level, meaning that they make a lot of comments. But their comments, which again are rated separate from them, get a lot of high ratings. So while the top number one on both lists is the same, when we look at number three with Christina, we see that although she has a lower score, people seem to really like what she says. Looking at feedback given away, this is actually people who have spent it out of their feedback banks. And I'm going to zoom through. Looking at a user profile, uh, we are able to see all of this data that's available to anybody on the system. You can see who has given them feedback. You can even click in to see the list of who gave this person this feedback and continue to iterate down. So I wanted to show one example of a folded content, uh, comment in context. Here we have just a snippet of one of our discussions. And at the very top, we see that this has been folded due to low feedback score. But you can get in there to see what it says. If I click on that, I can see it and I can say, wait, that shouldn't be folded. That doesn't bother me. I can give it positive feedback, and it will appear as it normally would. This allows the community to decide what is appropriate to actually be visible in the community. They're not flagging it for somebody else to make a decision on their behalf. They're actually finding that stasis point. Thanks so much, Thomas, and, and thanks also for uh, introducing the idea that there can be a difference between boneheaded questions and boneheaded people. Um, everyone here is allowed uh, quite a few boneheaded questions before we turn you into a boneheaded person. Uh, and, and as we move into the questions phase of this, uh, I'm hoping that people won't be shy about that. But 
I, I'm, I'm sensing a distant presence. I, I'm sensing from far off Oxford uh, that, that, that Jay-Z wants to participate in this conversation. And I, I'm hoping that my telepathy is working correctly and that we're capable of pulling them on screen at this point. I'm hoping that my random pattern is signaling the AV people that this is the time at which JV, <laughs> Jay-Z comes on screen so that he can ask questions to my panelists. And and we can hear you. All right, well, I'd like to believe that I have a unique, persistent identity, but sometimes I wonder. Uh, Tom told us that there's no God-like figure running at gather.com. I took that maybe to mean that he thinks God is dead. If God is dead, what are we left with? Well, I want to try to integrate across each of the presentations we've just heard, all of which get at how to get people together, how to have them exchange meaningful information and work together, and how curated it should be. Um, by posing a hypothetical of sorts, because thinking back to Ethan's trajectory, the chart of uh, internet uptake, it still supposes that there's the real world and then there's the internet world. And I do think that the hype on it notwithstanding, we're starting to enter the realm where the two worlds are becoming inextricably intertwined. So, as I dwell on the kinds of reputation systems that Thomas has leveraged in quite an interesting way on the Omnidar network, I wonder if we were to put that into the physical world. Uh, suppose you entered a cafe in Paris you've never been before, and you have with you your PDA, your personal digital assistant, and the first question you can ask it is, is anyone on my buddy list in this cafe right now? And what would normally be left to serendipity, you don't have to worry about, because if someone you know enough to be your buddy is 300 yards away or less, you can ensure, especially if they have similarly configured their PDA, that you can do the same thing. Can you still hear me okay? Oh yeah, yep. Yep. we're with you. All right. So then imagine that you could also ask your PDA, I'd like to know if any of the 10 closest friends of my 10 closest friends are here, whether or not I've ever met them myself. And that might be quite interesting. If you're 10 closest friends, surely you might want to meet some of their very closest friends and have an opportunity in the cafe to sit and talk to them. And you can start to now go to town. Once you've got people running around with PDAs that have joined this network, you could say, I'd like to meet anybody that was at Beyond Broadcast at the same time I was, or anybody who was from my year in college or graduate school or high school or elementary school. But as you widen those objective criteria to meet people, you start running into the same problems you do when you have a big pile of people contributing to a message board or participating in a project or submitting lots of videos to a clearinghouse. And that is that you have too much stuff and you want to know something about the quality before you have to experience it. And for that, we then turn to ratings. So suppose after you've met somebody in the cafe, you can actually, like you would on a remote control for a TiVo, give them a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And as you do that, uh, you can always change your vote. So even if you conspire with each other in full view of the first to give mutual thumbs up, as soon as you leave, you can change it to thumbs down if you didn't really like them after all. And that will be but one small vote contributing to their overall reputation score. And maybe you can even rate your experience with them and then them separately, just as Thomas would have us rate individual posts separate from the person. So it will turn out that the system figures out this person is terrible at lunch, but great at golf. Or he's good in a classroom environment, but everybody hates him at work. And before you know it, with that unique, persistent identity, but without any one entity judging you as a godlike figure, you see that your reputation can precede you, so that some people who enter this cafe might be fitting the profile more or less of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad uh, that Brendan referred 
minute or two, and suddenly a chill passes over the cafe, except for those few whose profiles and collaborative filtering indicate that that's exactly the kind of person they'd like to be right now. Others may have a profile that says, uh, like Jimmy Stewart in It's a Wonderful Life, everybody suddenly wants to meet them. And now there exists a different cafe depending on who you are and what your reputation is when you walk in. And God forgive the person who chooses to walk in without a transponder. He must have something huge to hide. Now this kind of world seems troubling to me. It doesn't seem all that speculative. It's actually bringing some of the tools that you're seeing demonstrated and refined in environments that are online. And I'm not against them. I want to say I love these environments. And I think these reputation tools, even the ones as crude as are found on Amazon.com or eBay, not the refined ones that you just saw demoed here, are great. But they ask us the question, if we start porting them into the real world for the very useful, tantalizing, irresistible purpose of helping us to figure out who do we want to connect with and how we want to connect with them when otherwise we would just be alone at that cafe and not connecting with anybody because you shouldn't be too friendly with strangers. It raises all sorts of questions about how to govern the space and, in essence, how to structure our online and soon-to-be online and offline environments together in a way that brings out our best side, that it doesn't just have us picking people back and forth or having reputations that we can't escape, but rather creating environments that will soon be tried out in the physical world too, that bring out truly the best in us and that maximize the kinds of connections that can take place, both between people who are likely matches and between people who might be surprised, but pleasantly so, to have a chance uh, to meet each other. So, so in, in, in posing this hypothetical, um, you've probably uh, now all figured out that the Jay-Z that we are referring to is uh, Jonathan Zittrain, uh, legal scholar, not Jay-Z the rap mogul. Uh, legal scholars are... are uh, le le legal scholars are, are, are known for posing complex hypotheticals. Uh, Jay-Z, not so much. Uh, although we did have 99 that. problems, and we'll move on from there. Um, Jay-Z, I'm, I'm wondering if you know how hard it is to think about God when I have Big Brother looking over my left shoulder. <laughs> so so, so Jay-Z outlined a hypothetical here, which is essentially extending a lot of the technologies we've talked about here, reputation technologies, recommendation technologies, technologies for friend finding, and extending it down to devices that we carry with ourselves every day and every moment. Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Is this where we're going? And I know that Brendan would like a chance to answer this, so I'll go to him first. I, I would worry about the effect that it would have on journalism, uh, because I think that uh, everybody gets a fresh start with strangers, uh, and there's, there's actually there's a certain beauty in that. Uh, and if I were interviewing someone out in the world and I discovered that perhaps he had been unkind to his children, um, I, I might treat him differently. Um, even, if his, uh, even if his verifiability score on facts were high, if I had that history of him and if I had his, his credit rating or his person rating, I, I don't know that I would take what he has to say as, 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 as seriously. And, and I think that's something that that we've learned in, in, in our threads is that there's a certain value to anonymity because often somebody can make an excellent point regardless of who he is and you don't need to know. So, so uh, well, I, I, I want to make sure that Thomas jumps in on this since he's actually building the system that we're going to build in in the French cafe example. But if Tom wants to jump in first, let's let him. Um, actually, there are some services that are out there already that are close to doing this. Um, I take my laptop with me all over the place, so uh, it feels as though it's available to me. Uh, things like Jambo Networks, things like a Place Site, which actually allow you to see who's in the same wireless vicinity as you are. Um, it's not quite down to the GPS level of this is, they are three meters to your right, just look. Uh, but they allow you to know who's sort of in your um, sphere of influence. And I think that this this notion of folks actually being able to uh, act one way uh, with a certain group of people and act completely different to another cert, uh, group of people is uh, that ability is falling apart. Uh, you can no longer have somebody who's very sweet and sensitive in front of the cameras and then acts completely differently once they're off. And I think that's actually a pretty good thing 
Um, but we still haven't figured out how you can show what part of your reputation you want to build or to uh, uh, destruct in any given situation. If I'm a really good cook and I go to a restaurant, I don't want people to think that I'm a really good cook there and rate my uh, review of the restaurant based on how well I can cook because I may be reviewing based on the ambiance. Mm. You know, I come at this from a totally different angle, I think, which is that we already do this in the world. Um, if someone calls me, and I don't know who they are, but they say that uh, Ethan sent them to me, you better believe I'm going to check them out with Ethan and see if they're credible before I make the call back. Now, that person was anonymous a moment ago. They used some network-related reference to say that they uh, had something in common, and I'm going to use the same network to go out and check on that person. Uh, gossip spreads reputation, either positive or negative, on people that we've never met before. And I guarantee if you look at the person on your right and you look at the person on your left, you have already made hundreds of assumptions about that person without ever having met them, talked to them, or said a single word to them. So I think that we do this in the offline world unconsciously thousands and thousands of times a year. The question, I think what Thomas is trying to do um, on the ombudsmanetwork.net and what we do on Gather with user ratings and content organization and author organization based on quality or popularity or by topic is to map these very healthy, very uh, useful offline processes because we don't want to talk to everybody in the world. You don't want to meet everybody in the world. You don't want to have a conversation with everybody in the world. You want to have a conversation with interesting people, people who have something unique and novel to say, people who are going to inform and educate uh, you. Uh, we can take these offline systems and make them work online. And if we're going to have anonymous connections happen more frequently in the online space, I think it's ex even more important that we create systems that are going to make these connections informed because we can't possibly interact with all the folks that might want to or try to interact with us. Um, in that domain. Bria, would you like a shot at this one? Or? No, I, I... Well, we actually have another question queued yeah. up specifically for you, which we can give to you as well. But that I like, we'd, yes. we'd love to hear you on this one as well, if you, if you want to take a pass at it. Let's get to the one that's specifically okay. for so, me. So currently the most popular question, by, by the way, we are digitally mediated here. So those of you actually hoping to ask a question, just find someone with a laptop and you know get it typed in. We'll get to you that way. Um, are youth media organizations relevant in an age when any youth can go online and create their own media by themselves? Well, I don't know that I agree with that assumption. I think for the young people who, certainly the ones who participate in the organization supported by Listen Up, um, these youth media organizations, these community-based organizations are often the only place that they can have access to the tools to make media. I think it's very easy to sit in this space and sort of forget that. But for a lot of young people, um, those tools aren't necessarily right at hand. So youth media organizations, apart from all of the obvious youth development stuff um, that we can go on and on about, youth media organizations provide an actual physical space for young people to learn these tools of technology and communication. Um, and even if you are a young person for whom access is not a question, um, audience still is. And I think uh, one of the things that, you know, I, I pay a lot of attention to the work that young people are producing and putting online, et cetera. Um, and, you know, if you're a relatively popular kid and you've got some friends, et cetera, you start off with a small audience base. Um, however, if you're a young person plugged into a youth media organization that has a mechanism um, for bringing an audience, I think you'd find the experience much more satisfactory. So on several levels, I would, I would argue that youth media organizations continue to be very relevant, and I don't think that that's being threatened at all. So it's a nice way to uh, question some of the assumptions behind that question. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a number of other questions queued up here. Uh, Jay-Z, also feel free to jump in, uh, particularly if, if any of these catch your fancy as well. I will. I'll one short and it will be exactly the wrong microphone. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll allow you a little bit of awkwardness. We understand that the British are, are sometimes a bit awkward, and you're getting over there, and I'm sure it's, it's affecting you over time. Oh, man. Is, is, there a, is there a crisp transfer protocol that we can get that down to my workstation on? Um, so, um, 
speaking of awkward, um, we have a, a, a couple of um, maybe slightly pointed questions uh, from my colleague to my left. Um, I'm going to throw out one of them uh, first that hasn't uh, been answered yet online, although it keeps jumping around on my screen. Come on. The problem with the auto reload? It, well, every time it reloads, they jump around. Um, okay, Tom, was reading my friend Dan Gretsch of Marketplace on Gather, mm -hmm. he's not getting a whole lot of conversation going there. Are there disadvantages to having a vast amorphous space as opposed to the ROS garden model? Um, <laughs> you'll forgive me if I uh, think vast amorphous space uh, isn't an accurate description. You know, what, what I described very briefly in my in initial comments was that on Gather, we have more than a publishing space. So if I think of vast amorphous spaces, the, the world, you know, the, the huge universe of places you can publish online, the, the blogosphere might be a huge vast amorphous space because the content isn't, um, from a reader's perspective, well organized uh, or organized by uh, today, in most cases, quality, though you can use some tools, obviously, to do that. Um, the gather content is not just published by our members but it's org organized by our members topically using a tag system and edited by our members where our community brings the stuff that they find most interesting to the top. They do that through their readership. You can see the most viewed articles on Gather or most viewed articles on politics or on food or on travel or on poetry. They do that through their comments. You can see the, the content that is driving the most discussion. Uh, they do that through uh, their rating system. So you can see the stuff that the community has thought is highest quality. Uh, what that means is that some authors are going to develop a following on Gather, and some are going to develop, in fact, what is a, a, a subscriber base. You could subscribe free to Gather authors and be notified when new content comes out. Um, and others are going to get less traction. That is, frankly, a marketplace working exactly how the marketplace should. The community is responding to some of the content and pulling it up to the top. At uh, Gather, we added another element, which has made this uh, we believe, or will make this, we added it this week, so we don't know that it has made this, but we added it this week, that we believe will make this um, more successful, which is that we're now compensating through a revenue share our community members based on the quality and the popularity of the content that they submit. It is a market-driven, uh, completely market-driven media creation uh, model. Rather than paying a freelancer two bucks a word, we'll pay them uh, what the community thinks they're worth, again, quality and popularity-wise. And so that's going to mean that certain people have, uh, in this market, be the th top political thinkers, community identified, the top food writers, community identified, and they're going to have the largest audience and, as they should, the biggest financial reward for their work. I would say that this isn't a sign that something's not working, but rather a sign that something is working. And folks like Raymond Learcy, um, whose lecture from Iran had 47 comments uh, that were detailed, thoughtful pieces, um, are uh, winning in this model and are good examples of, of the thought marketplace doing exactly what it is. So, so let, let's open this up a little bit to the other panelists. Um, Gather is using market mechanisms to figure out um, who we want to listen to and who we want to compensate and how we want to essentially reward people from being members of, of uh, the Gather community. Uh, we've got three other community builders at the table here. Uh, to what extent is this a model that you think is interesting, is workable, is similar, is different to, to what you're doing here? And I know that Brendan wants to jump in. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a question actually on the, on, on the question rating mechanism here um, that sort of ties into the same line of thought, which the question reads, should NPR allow itself to be tied into a proprietary walled garden approach to content as opposed to seeking out their legitimate, authentic community like the Nashville station is doing? And, and the question is, obviously weighted. We kind of know what the questioner <laughs> thinks is true. Um, Wh but, which might be why I haven't asked it yet. Well, I'll, 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 I, I think um, my, my answer to that, and it's also my response to the, to the walled garden uh, approach, is that uh, some of the most interesting people who are, who are writing things for themselves are producing video for themselves on the net. Um, they have already created their own communities. They already have their own Internet existence. Um, a lot of them are here in the room. Andy Carvin, Steve Garfield. These are like, I'd love to use your audio and put it uh, on the site. If, if, uh, if we didn't have Global Voices, we wouldn't have a show once a week um, for, for open source. And it's asking a lot of these people who have, for one reason or another, created their own business models, whether it's just the personal joy they get out of creating this content, whether they've got their own advertising on their own site, 
to come in, take all of their data, all of their time, and invest it in your garden. So we've really focused on creating a different definition of community, which is building these casual links out to people, expecting them to check in if they have something to say, expecting them to answer emails when, when we want their opinions on something, but otherwise sort of letting them continue uh, along what it is they're already doing without any nudging from us. Thomas, Ria, do you want to jump in on this topic? Well, we certainly, um, we have various mechanisms um, to sort of gauge participation, et cetera. One of the things, one of the most common things is voting. Um, young people can go on and vote for the pieces of, of video that they like the most, and those routinely bubble to the front of our, of our website. So the front page changes every day with a new piece of media, um, you know, there, that's, that we don't, that the listen up staff people don't get to vote on. The other interesting thing when you were talking about the marketplace and people getting financial compensation, I guess the thing that's most similar in terms of listen up is that, again, listen up on this other side functions as, um, an organization that provides funding to youth media groups who want to produce media for broadcast. And in fact, a lot of those, uh, when we sit around the table after we've had RFPs and we think about the reputation that each organization has, it certainly is impacted um, by the number of votes that their particular pieces of, me of media have received, how often they come up on our hot list, et cetera, et cetera. So when we're asked even to curate things for festivals, and sometimes there's some financial gain to that sometimes, and, and uh, we, we again look to our website to see which are the pieces that are most popular and the way that they're determined to be most popular is by the user. So that, you know, to, to step back, when we think about who would receive funding to participate in a, in a broadcast project, it goes back to those folks who are, who've had success on our site. Not entirely, but somewhat. And when we think about, um, you know, if a festival calls us up and says, we want a package dealing with such and such issue, we immediately go to our website and look for those pieces that are most popular that live on the on the site. And, and Thomas, I suspect you're going to tell me that that connects uh, quite a bit to, to how uh, Omidyar Network uh, works on, on these issues. Well, with Omidyar Network, we're providing a collaborative space where people can find these shared interests. And we find that the shared interest is what's really fueling people to connect with each other and do things they otherwise might not have. So by providing a space where anybody can join and anybody can contribute anything, um, the opportunities for these, uh, um, someone I see called it uh, serendipity, but the <coughs> opportunity for people to find these shared interests and actually turn it from interest, shared interest into talking about it and then actually going out and doing something about it, that's where we really see the payoff in the space. So another question that it's filtered to the top of the list, although in some ways is uh, really a question for this morning's panels, but we've got some awfully smart people here. Uh, and actually, I, I think I'm, I'm going to throw this one to Jay-Z first uh, and then sort of see whether the other panelists want to take this on. But how should public media organizations be involved in the battle for network neutrality? And how might citizen-generated content and media be affected? Uh, to 
make the case for ensuring that a diversity of, a multiplicity of viewpoints can get heard through the ISP? So I've just got word here that the webcast viewers are having some difficulty hearing Jay-Z, and we apologize for this. We advise telepathy. It's really just a matter of concentrating hard enough. But to try to sort of summarize very roughly those comments, one of the concerns with network neutrality is that if bottlenecks are put into a network to prevent certain types of activity, and one of those activities is free speech, this has real implications for the concerns of society as a whole. Also, the observation that public media has an enormous amount of trust, and Jay-Z asserts not just on the left but also on the right, and that this may be a space where it's very important that public media remain neutral, diverse, transparent in one fashion or another. I hope I'm close to what it is that you actually said. Other people who want to weigh in on the issue of public media and network neutrality, should public media be taking a lead in the fight on network neutrality? Is public media worried about network neutrality? Is this something that people are staying up at night worrying about? Go ahead. I think it's a tricky question because as a voter, I have a really clear stand on net neutrality. I'm for it. But as a broadcaster, we do have an obligation to, as much as we often sometimes hate to do it, to present the entirety of the debate. So I would look at it a little differently. I think we, one of the things that we talk about a lot in story meetings at Open Source is that what the geeks worry about is important. And they are as important now as metallurgists used to be or environmentalists were 30 years ago. They are watching things happen that are going to affect us in five or ten years. And they worry about the power of Google. They worry about the consequences of the loss of net neutrality. And I think that we carry an obligation to not be scared of these incredibly dorky topics and jump into them and explain them to people in a language. That's our job, to explain them to people, to really lay out what the consequences might be. I think the basic message is we can't be scared of them. Other folks want to weigh in on this? I'll tell you, I actually think that the big debate will happen in the consumer marketplace if net neutrality goes down. And... My gut is it's going to be really hard for somebody to sell a service that provides 68% of the content, uh, that blocks their consumer from seeing some of the stuff the consumer is going to want to see. Um, it'd be tough to sell a phone service if Verizon or, or uh, T-Mobile didn't let you call 10% of the people in your network. Um, it'd be tough to sell a cable service if you didn't have the vast majority of cable content out there. I think it's really tough to, to sell that service. It's a big competitive uh, negative differentiator for somebody that doesn't offer it all. So my gut, I, I, I debate not whether or not net neutrality is important. I think open access to information is absolutely important and a critical part, um, a critical part of democracy uh, in this country and around the world. But I think that the question is, would companies that do try to cut it off survive? And I think that the market would probably beat the heck out of them, and any competitor that offered open access would beat the heck out of them, and we'd have a marketplace that took care of that for us, is my gut. Don't know that we should rely on it, but that's my gut. I, I think we have space for about two more questions. Uh, one that has uh, just risen to the top of the voting uh, through the tyranny of the majority, as one of the commenters mentions, is uh, what might some of the drawbacks uh, to community voting be? Could good content get lost? Could bad or fraudulent uh, content uh, rise to the top. What does voting really mean? Is it provocatively good, provocatively bad, cool, uncool? How, how does this play in the world of voting for video? We just wrapped a, a competition um, called I'm Big in Youth Media. And several of the, several of the categories were awarded based simply on uh, the number of votes and the, and the popularity. But we do recognize at Listen Up, for example, that um, you know young people are an interesting group of, of individuals, I'm sure you all know. And, they can, uh, and it's important for us to have a balance between, I think, um, this notion of cool and good. Sometimes, uh, 
and I'll make a vast generalization here, I found that boys in particular are drawn to work that is um, very flashy. You know, the, I, we once saw a piece, it was five minutes long and the whole thing happened backward, but, but really, really quickly as though you'd watched five minutes worth of rewind. And, you know, it was made by a young man and all the boys in the, in the audience were hooting and clapping and they loved it. And some of the young women were sort of looking at each other like, where's the story? What the hell? Is this, is this experimental? I don't think so. And, and so we find that sometimes the things that get votes, depending on, you know, the, the demographic that's voting, um, is very different from what the general notion may be of what's good or what's interesting or what's valuable. And so we do try to strike a balance, but it, it it, it does provide for quite a bit of tension, I would say. So th there's a, a huge number of questions in the queue, uh, but I know that Thomas wants to weigh in on this one, so I'm going to uh, let him have a say on this, and I, I'm going to see if we can squeeze in one last one at the end. Thanks. So part of what I wasn't able to get into is some of the lessons that we've learned on Amidir.net um, because I didn't want an orange in my ear. Uh, <laughs> but one of the things that we have seen is that people seem to be allergic to negative feedback. Um, it's this notion, it's not only receiving it, but it's giving it. And people actually, I've been surprised at how much thought folks put into giving away negative feedback. And that seems to start a chain of events. There's some people who believe that there's no room for negative feedback anywhere on Amidir.net. And whenever they see a negative sign, they'll give it positive points just to get it out of that bad negative area. And then all of a sudden, it's no longer about the content, but it's about the game of moving the score up and down and it completely divorces from uh, anything that it once, uh, whatever was said first to begin this war, many, many, many pages of discussion ago is when that was hashed out. And our, one of our longest discussions right now is a 400 comment discussion of whether somebody deserves negative feedback or not. And, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, please. <laughs> okay. um, I just noticed the connection It doesn't mean it's bad, but just as I think so much of regular broadcast was and maybe still is chained to the Nielsen ratings, uh, the little diaries. And, you know, I remember my family was a Nielsen family briefly, and we had this thing about bad ratings where I felt bad saying Little House on the Prairie wasn't watched in our household, and so we made a sympathy vote. Um, <laughs> so you can't blame us with mafia, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Those very measurements then start to translate in much more subtle ways and sophisticated ways, just as you're describing Thomas, into the virtual world, and they have such power and such interesting social reverberations uh, as to what the meaning of a negative vote even is. And I see you trying to say, no, no, it's just a dispassionate mark of quality or lack, and I hear Rhea saying it doesn't even have to be objective quality, but just what's meaningful to a particular group or subgroup of, of people. So I, I don't know, at least I see Nielsen is getting more subtle, uh, but I don't know if, uh, I still see the, the, the power and therefore the danger of measurement. So uh, I just want to say, uh, we're getting fantastic questions sort of live on the screen here. Um, a lot of the questions that have come up and are voted very highly are really for sort of one person or other on the panel. And I strongly encourage you to corner the panelists after the fact and ask them this. I know for a fact that they're going to be around during the demos and cocktails and so on and so forth. So please ask them face to face just to sort of wrap this up and, and make sure that everyone gets a chance to chime in on the last topic. You too, JC. Um, I, I want to sort of modify a question slightly, which is to say, in a single sentence, what advice would you guys give to broadcasters as they think about nurturing and creating digital communities? Tom? I think that uh, in a single sentence, throw out everything you know about how to engage your audience and begin by understanding that this is a fundamentally new way of connecting individual audience members one to another rather than your audience to you. That was, in fact, a single sentence. It was wasn't a run -on. even. No, 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 no. <laughs> we weren't even dependent clauses in there. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I have just one word: intentionality. That qualifies within my definition. 
I, 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 Thomas is, is, is jumping to get in, so we're going to give Jay-Z and, and Brendan a chance to think a bit more about this one. So, Thomas. I was just going to say that if you, dang, I have to start the sentence over. <laughs> start. Uh, <laughs> if you give the community the tools to manage itself and can give them the space to do it, um, they will. Mm. Brendan? If I give my sentence, can I explain it afterwards? No. That's why I went for the one word. In the absence of any other structure, given that people talking to each other crave rules, don't be afraid to be a dictator. Can't explain. Jesse? My final bit of advice would be um, listen more, talk less. And with that, uh, we're going to stop talking. And uh, thank you all for great questions online. Thanks, our panelists, uh, for being great participants and great sports. Thanks so much.